Well, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining uh, day two of the GCC um, 2023 India Summit. And today we are concentrating on connecting education. And uh, we had a great first day yesterday. Um, that recording can be uh, seen on um, the uh, on YouTube. And uh, and if you haven't uh, received um, the link, then Naveen Shaw uh, with GCC and Kate Moore with JCC, GCC uh, can send that to to you if you just want to reach out to them, and uh, we'll have their contact details at the end of today's session. Um, to begin with, uh, my name is Matt Burns. I am with the International Internship Network. Um, we, uh, as, as the name would suggest, we are a network of internship providers and universities across the globe, and uh, we uh, pair up universities, students, employers, uh, and uh, into internships. So if you want to find out more, you can uh, visit internship-network.org. We also have a conference coming up in June, June 13th to the 15th at in uh, Indianapolis in the U.S. at the Indian, uh, Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, uh, or also known as I, IUPUI. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to do is introduce one of our hosts today, uh, who is Kate Moore. She is the co-founder and uh, president of the Global Career Center. And also today, you'll be seeing a lot of Naveen Shaw, uh, who is Kate's uh, right-hand person in India. And, and Naveen does a great job uh, with students uh, both in India and coming from abroad to India. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Kate Moore. Thank you, Matt, and thank you for your help in uh, convening this conference, serving as our technical partner. Uh, the GCC is a proud member of the IIN. Wow, that was a lot of acronyms, and I'm going to throw one more at you. Our convening partner is NMIMS, and I want to thank them very much for helping bring this event together. As Matt mentioned, um, we had a great day yesterday. I'll let you slide to the next slide for me, Matt. And um, you'll see we've set up a Padlet for day one and day two. Uh, the QR code is there as well as the um, website, which we'll put in the chat for you to be able to access as well. Uh, just a quick overview of some of the things that we uh, talked about in day one. Um, certainly had some amazing uh, practical advice from our keynote, looking at how students and uh, professionals move through their career almost in an hourglass shape, where at the beginning you're able to um, explore a lot, um, try, test out assumptions, even make um, some mistakes along the way, have those internships, get that international experience, and then get more of a um, more of a uh, expertise or a domain area expertise in the middle of your career and then build up to more management level or leadership in the future as well. On the Padlet, you'll see a lot of the themes and ideas and topics that came up around how things are changing for online hybrid and in-person work, as well as some changes for the gig economy, uh, career clusters, contextualizing of our careers, and also looking at specifically how it's impacting the NGO and startup sector as well. As Matt mentioned, the entire day one is available on recording via the IIN YouTube. Check that out or, or rewatch if you're able to attend as well. Now, one thing working in experiential education that we often see or often talk about actually, is that moving from theory to practice where you learn and then you do. Chris Tang, actually our last speaker of the day yesterday from the University of Auckland said it quite nicely, the fact that he was taught things at University of Auckland, but he would never have been able to learn them until he came for his international internship in India. At GCC, we do work with inbound, outbound, online, hybrid, on-site, all focused on customized programs, partnering with universities to develop and deliver internships around the world. So we see that experiential learning cycle from um, learning to doing. Our cycle for today is sort of that way as well, except the learning was based on employer uh, and student input yesterday 
what are we looking for in the world of work? How is it changing? How we can we prepare? And today we have an amazing jam packed uh, few hours for you. Um, I hope you have your, your virtual passports ready because we are going to travel the world, visit lots of countries and cities, hear about a lot of different programs and services and expertise, and really have that opportunity to see how preparing for employability and that changing of work, of work can be put into practice through specific practices and programs, et cetera. Um, our colleague Naveen, as Matt mentioned, uh, is a, a key person for us in India. If questions come up about any of the programs or services or experts along the way, feel free to reach out to Naveen and she'll get you in touch with the right person. Um, and I'm also happy to say we're celebrating 10 years uh, since we first opened an office in India. So with that celebration, we get a chance to welcome our friends and colleagues, peer organizations and experts to talk about how they connect education to employability through programs and services. And uh, I will um, certainly um, look forward to hearing from folks throughout the day. Um, and I think we'll actually kick things off by uh, uh, actually uh, moving over to my colleague, Chris McKenzie. Um, Matt, I'll have you stop sharing screen so we can have Chris share his. Um, and also, I know I've already thanked NMIMS, but I also wanted to thank Mina, who's on the call right now, uh, for her support of this event and partnership along the way as well, too. So thank you, Mina, too. Great. Um, so. Um, over to you, Chris. Um, Chris is co-founder of the Global Career Center. Um, I, uh, I first met Chris when he was at Michigan State University, a fantastic colleague, and I'll let him talk to you all about team-based projects as we start our tour around the world. Thanks so much for being here, Chris. Thanks, Kate. Hi, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. Um, I'm in Michigan in the United States, just outside of Detroit, uh, on your first stop on your world tour this morning. And we have a, a, a American football team here at the collegiate level, the University of Michigan Wolverines, and they have a famous coach uh, from the late 1960s. His name was Bo Schembechler. And Michigan had a long storied tradition with American football, uh, but the team had a rough decade in the 60s. They weren't very good. And they brought Bo Schembechler in and he stressed the team, the team, the team. It's one of his most famous quotes, whether you like American football or not, is kind of irrelevant, but that's what we're gonna talk about today. And what he was really referencing is um, the Michigan Wolverines had to learn how to play as a team, not as individuals. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, how uh, students who generally might study or even work independently learn the necessary skills uh, to become part of a team. And we do that with team-based projects. Um, as Kate mentioned, I'm Chris McKenzie. I'm a founding member of Global Career Center. I'm also an independent consultant in international uh, higher ed, working on a variety of different projects. And as I was putting together this short presentation, I realized that I have been facilitating team-based experiences since the early 1990s, 1991 to be exact. Um, that's a long time. Don't wanna think about that too much. Um, but let's jump right in. Um, what is a team-based project? I'm sure you might all have your own definitions of what, those, of what a team-based project is, um, but it's a, a group of participants uh, tasked with a relevant predetermined project that has real world outcomes. It's also set over a very specific period of time. And that time could vary. It might be four weeks. It might be a semester length. The time could also vary within the project. Maybe it's five hours a week. Maybe it's 20 hours a week. But that all depends. Um, it is usually completed um, uh, as complementary to a course of study, or it might even be embedded in a program uh, at the end of a program, such as a capstone. There are also a couple, couple different ways to approach a uh, team project. The simplest form uh, is two people, maybe three people uh, working on a project. Let's talk about uh, working for a financial or, or a venture capitalist firm, and they want a project on a merger and acquisition. Two or three financial students could get together, and they could work on that uh, project uh, to determine if 
a merger or acquisition is appropriate for that particular firm. A more complex form of a team-based project is maybe multidisciplinary. So uh, let's talk about product development. You might have a few students who are engineers, a few students who are in business ops, and a few students in marketing. And they're all working together doing slightly different things, but the end result is the same. How do we get our product into the market? And then there's all the room in between those two simple to complex where you can develop team-based projects as well. Compared to say an internship or a co-op, uh, support for a team-based project is a little bit different and, and I think oftentimes necessary. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's predefined, right? So you know exactly what your project is, you know what your deliverables are, uh, you have uh, deliverables along the way each week, potentially, as well. The mentorship part is key. GCC does a terrific job of this as assigning a mentor to each team, specifically for that team. And, uh, there are many other organizations that use the mentorship approach as well. Um, Universities might also assign a mentor. Maybe it's a faculty, maybe it's a staff member, but regardless, that checkpoint for students that's not the host organization is really important to uh, build that support in a team-based project situation. And also the fellow team members. Um, we all know uh, developing teams or, or teams take time to develop. Um, so we have to make sure those team members first get to know each other, get to trust each other, and then they can use each other to bounce off the ideas off each other and also support each other. So when you're thinking about constructing a team-based project, you wanna make sure that you add the support mechanism to it as well. Um, benefits of a team-based project. There's certainly educational benefits. Um, they're gonna gain knowledge. They're gonna gain industry knowledge, um, they're going to understand uh, project scopes. Uh, they're going to understand how an organization works internally. Um, they're going to understand a local business culture, maybe not in their own country. They're going to learn how to network at a global level. Other educational benefits are the acquisition of skills. That's a big component of this, as Kate mentioned in her introduction, moving from that theory to that practice. So they're going to learn skills, some of the obvious skills, teamwork, time management, but then some other skills that might not be as obvious, research and how to effectively research, how to synthesize data, how to do analysis of data, communication, um, which is honestly, it's different than teamwork as you probably well know, and it's gonna be different depending on what the local culture is as well. And then they're gonna understand uh, peer relationships and get that gain that skill of peer to peer relationships, but client relationships at some point. And then also maybe it's their first time ever working as uh, an employee in a sense. So how uh, to build a relationship with your supervisor. The third educational benefit is going to be abilities. Um, uh, one of the biggest things Kate always talks about is uh, the ambiguity of work. So can they navigate that? Can they deal with that stress or that anxiety and still get the work done? Um, collaborating across cultures, collaborating across time zones and making sure you can do that effectively. Um, presentation skills. Most projects, there's some deliverable at the end or in the middle or somewhere where the student is actually going to have to present. And that could be one-on-one -on -one to their supervisor, or it could be a team presentation to their supervisor as well. And then the other um, thing that we might all take for granted, because we've been doing it now for the past three years and many of, of uh, other years as well, but the, the use of digital tools, whether it be Zoom or other digital communication tools and work tools to get the particular project done. So from an educational standpoint, they're gaining knowledge, skills, and abilities with their peers in a short amount of time. Some additional benefits you might not think about when you're when you're looking at this at a program, programmatic level, cost savings to students. There's no travel potentially if you're doing this virtually or online. Time commitment is probably not 40 hours a week and for a semester. Um, they have the ability to do things both synchronously and asynchronously. So there's a lot of offline work that's completed in a team-based project. 
with GCC and with other organizations, there are going to be um, professional development workshops embedded within that as well that a GCC or a, a partner provider would deliver. Uh, they could be simple things like a resume review. They could be mock interviews. Uh, they could just be question and answer sessions on how to communicate up to your supervisor or how to communicate across the team level. I think one of the other additional benefits of a team-based project is where it's placed within the student's professional development plan. There's a continuum there and, and students are gonna progress from something maybe pretty simple, their first experience outside of the classroom to something much more complex like an internship or an apprenticeship down the road. So when programming, you wanna think this is a benefit. This is part of that uh, ladder where a student can move from one experience to another experience. Talking about students which are uh, uh, best suited for teams projects, this is also one of the beauties of a team project. Team projects can be sourced um, to match where the student is in their academic level and in their skill level. So a first year student um, might have a very simple project of research. That's all they're going to do. No presentation, no data analysis, no anything else. They simply might conduct research for their project. Whereas a third year student, maybe they're doing the research, then they're doing the data analysis, and then they're presenting recommendations to the host organization, a much more complex team-based project. But the beauty of team-based projects is that flexibility. So if you're thinking about doing that programming, um, maybe you just wanna open it up for first year students, or maybe you just wanna do it for a third year student or as a capstone. But I urge you to think about that continuum as well. How can you stack these experience so you can move your students through their professional development plan? And here's a couple examples, simple examples of some team-based projects. Um, an Australian-based mining company. They wanted to go into the US. They didn't know anything about the market. They didn't have the resources to hire an expensive consulting agency. So using students, um, uh, a group of four to six students, they looked at market entry into the US. A social media company um, working directly, a team-based project for the communication strategy, developing the social media calendar and drafting uh, uh, recommendations for suitable content. For a consumer goods startup, um, doing a SWOT analysis on a new product. And for an ed tech startup, um, conducting the actual beta testing, giving feedback and rec recommendations um, for market expansion opportunities. So these were real projects that real students have completed and we have many other examples we can talk about as well. The last thing I wanna share with you is just an example of what I'm talking about as far as a continuum goes and how you might wanna think about your academic framework for team-based projects where you wanna play, where that student is on this continuum. And this is just an example. Your continuum could be very different, um, but you notice each box is getting bigger and bigger and that's representing a greater scope of responsibility for whatever that project is. So in this particular example, I have team-based uh, to my left um, because maybe that's gonna be one of the first experiences a student's going to have. And then they might progress and they might be a second year student and they're gonna have a practicum embedded within one of their courses or one of their semesters. And ultimately that's gonna to lead to their uh, internship between their second and third year or after their third year. So I want you to think about um, that continuum and team-based projects as a tool within a broader picture of experiential learning. Kate, I don't know if we're doing questions and answers here or are there more at the end, um, but that was my quick run through. I think I might've gone over time a little bit and I apologize no. to whoever's next. No worries. We're gonna save Q&A to the end and also have um, folks add that in chat and to the uh, Padlet. Um, I'll, uh, I thank you. That was great, wonderful setup. And uh, we'll hand it over to Naveen to talk to get our next speaker up on board. Thanks again, Chris, fantastic. Sure, Kate.
Thank you, Kate. Thank you for uh, that this thing introduction. Um, I would like to bring in the next speaker on the moderated showcase uh, session today. That's Dr. Anupam Rastogi. Uh, he is a professor of finance at the NMIMS Mumbai. He is chairman, career advisor committee, School of Business Management, Mumbai, and faculty in charge of MBA admissions in NMIMS University. His area of research includes strategic financial management, infrastructure financing, financial institutions, and emerging market economies. He has published extensively on infrastructure financing, economic modeling, and capital markets. He has been a consultant to the ADB and other international firms. He served on many government committees to enhance the flow of private capital into the infrastructure sector. He, he holds a BE honors in mechanical engineering from the Bits Pilani, MSc economics from the London School of Economics and PhD from the University of Liverpool. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you, Naveen, for uh, kind words. And uh, uh, just to get straight away into the topic that how it is that at NMIMS, we deal with the education so that our students are prepared for industry. So we being a member of, or rather we have been accredited by the AACSB, that is Association to Advanced Collegiate School of Business. So under this, as uh, most of you would know, is that mission is chosen by the faculty itself. In our mission, which we have chosen for our school, includes especially uh, critical thinking uh, skills to be developed among our students, number one. Number two, analytical skills to be developed, and finally, team player. So all our courses which we develop, we develop with the idea that these, uh, these learning objectives are there too. So I'll just give you uh, an example uh, of that, that how it is done. But before that, the whole process is driven by what is what we call board of studies, which is a common thing in most of the management institute. So this board of studies ensures that our, as far as our curriculum, et cetera, is concerned, is up to date. And the things which industry needs are there, uh, which helps them, helps our students in employability. Now, second thing is that not only it passes through board of studies of the, um, of the department, it also has to pass through the program level and then academic council, et cetera. That is a normal process. Now, we always stick to our uh, class learning objectives and uh, our program learning objectives, which is a key, uh, key thing as far as the AACSB accreditation is concerned. Now, this is as far as the total uh, education part is concerned over a period of six trimester, but our students, apart from that, they go through two internship. One internship is necessarily has to be with an NGO. And in fact, yesterday, a couple of employers of NGO, they talked about our students that how they have been there for three weeks, three, three and a half weeks, and they have done the job. Now, idea there is that we don't assign them any project there. It is the uh, NGO, which whatever, uh, project they have, they assigned to them, and they have got a mentor there, apart from the fact that there is a also faculty mentor. So under the project mentor, they would do the work, whatever is assigned to them, and after that, they write a report, which is an integral part of this particular uh, internship, and they come back to the come back to the college, and then the college, they are grilled on that particular thing that what they have done, why they have done, why all that is there. So this is one internship. It, the idea that necessarily they must go to a NGO is to make them aware of the uh, of real life situation, especially of India. And second internship, of course, in most of the institute it is done. And that is the summer internship where they do it with a, uh, with a, with a company. And again, the same thing is that the projects are assigned to them by the uh, company. And then it is, of course, overseen, overseen by, by the uh, faculty as well. Now, issue in both of them, which are integral part of our education, pro uh, our curriculum, is that they not only work 
within a real life situation, but they also do some productive work. In case of uh, NGO, NGOs are, tend to be short of hands or certain things which they would like to do, get it done, but do not have enough manpower or enough skill set that is provided by our students. Of course, in case of the another one where it is with their company, it is more from the point of view of uh, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of a gateway for companies to select uh, uh, select people whom they would, they, would, they would like to offer permanent employment or long-term employment. So this is what basically it is. Uh, just to show you that how we ensure as far as our learning objectives, et cetera, are concerned, I'll just share with you the screen of one of the uh, courses which I take, and that is the uh, Emerging Market Economies. And now the, the way Emerging Market Economies two years back, what it was, and what it is today and what it will be next year, this whole thing it has changed. And we keep up with, with that within the framework of our, our, um, uh, our class, uh, uh, our, our, class uh, uh, our class as well as our pro program deliverables. So let me just show, share with you here uh, this particular screen. Let's see if I can. Um, yeah, here it is. So very broadly, this is what it is. It just gives the course title, et cetera. And here the learning objectives, which are shared with the students are defined. And it says that this is what it will be doing, enable students to analyze a country's economic data, et cetera, and CLO2 and CLO3 uh, analytical examine the development trajectories of emerging economies, which is the second one. And third one is the overall impact of economic, political, and social development. Now, having done that, the most important part in this is how do you test it? So that particular part is given here. And in this, along with the, the CLO 1, 2, 3, 4, we just say that what part will be tested in the midterm exam, project report, and end of, uh, evaluation, uh, evaluation, and what is the weightages, et cetera, given. So this is how we do that. And as far as the student teaching part is concerned, right in the beginning, we describe one by one, as far as the sessions are concerned, that what is the topic, et cetera, is to be covered and what will be the pedagogy used. So this is basically what uh, is done as far as classroom teaching is concerned. And of course, I have already described as far as the internships are there, those two internships, which are integral part and the way they work. Now, proof of the pudding is really in, in uh, looking at it that how best uh, it uh, materializes as far as our students are concerned. So just to give you an idea um, in terms of uh, what, uh, how, how it works, uh, let me just show you that uh, how the place, how, how uh, placement has worked for our students through that. So here it is. Um, this is very broadly whatever I have talked about mission and, and all that. Here is the last four years of our average, uh, students' average salary. Uh, if you take 19, 2019, 20 years, 100 then it has been the same in 2021 uh, being the pandemic year, but after that 21, 22, it, it grew about in nominal terms in about 21, 22%. And for that, it has grown about 15, 16% last uh, this year. These are the 22, 23 students who are uh, yet to graduate. They will be graduating in, um, in April and will be will will be in their jobs from first May or first June on first June onwards, and uh, that's how it is. Thank you. It's great. Thank you so so much. Uh, really appreciate it. I'm going to take our our group back to the U.S. and actually to California, uh, where our colleague Omar is going to speak about UC Riverside. I just want to make sure: are you in East Coast time or West Coast time right now? I think you may be our earliest riser 
regardless. Uh, well, I just um, arrived to DC last night. Um, I'm participating in the Washington International Education Council. So uh, thank God I'm, I'm uh, now it's uh, 7.30. So no, I'm in a good place. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you. And over to you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And nice to meet uh, everyone here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anupam. I mean, that was really uh, interesting to hear, and uh, I appreciate all the details uh, you mentioned in that presentation. Um, so I am Omar Medanat. I'm from the University of California, Riverside Extension, the continuing education part of the University of California. And uh, thank you to Kate for allowing this opportunity to talk about one of our programs that has been um, you know, taking the highlights um, uh, during the past couple of years. And uh, this program focuses on both uh, the education and the uh, practical part or the, the work experience, which could also affect the student life. Um, so what we notice in the University of California Riverside Extension is that during COVID, most of the people were trying to invest their time while everything was closed and shut down to take more of online courses, certificates, uh, diplomas. Um, and that came into uh, a real benefit once everything came back to normal because a lot of people has gained um, knowledge and experience in, in, in their major or other people who took or like shifted a little bit from what their main major is. So that brought to our attention the importance of um, what the regional market or the local market needs, especially after COVID. So um, we are the University of California, Riverside. We are part of the UC system. We're based in Southern California, about 40 minutes uh, from uh, Los Angeles. And we, we do um, professional certificates, uh, preparation uh, programs, and postgraduate certificate and diploma programs some uh, credit courses uh, with universities uh, and then custom programs. But today I'm specifically here to talk about our postgraduate diploma program. I just came back from India last week for um, a very extensive trip that I did four states of India speaking about the postgraduate diploma program where we had a lot of interest from um, India specifically. And we also have a lot of interest from Europe and the US uh, for this program because it allows students to um, take postgraduate level courses uh, at the University of California Riverside for one year and then combine it with one year practical work experience in the United States. Thank uh, DCC for um, allowing the opportunity uh, and playing a major part in, in this program because they help us uh, during uh, the internship and the OPT part of, of this program. So postgraduate certificate is uh, where we have different um, sectors or, or uh, different programs uh, offered to students from. Can I please ask everyone to, to mute uh, their mic so we can all hear? Thank you. Um, so we have different uh, sectors of the program where students can uh, come to UCR and study for business management, engineering, bioengineering, hospitality, and all of these uh, sections of the program. And uh, honestly, what we noticed is that even if a student has a business background, recently or after COVID, they try to shift a little bit from their main program and do, just do something different. Uh, like digital marketing or big data technology or event management, which will allow them to have a more um, um, a more appealing CV, a more diverse CV, because the local job market now, especially in countries like India, or I come from Jordan, so it, it really matters for employers to see a more diverse CV, and it opens a lot of opportunities for you know, new graduates to, to land on a really good uh, work opportunity. And um, as said by Dr. Anupam, it also affects the salary of students. So this program allows students to study at one of these uh, sectors. And this is how the program is structured. 
the first uh, quarter, three months of the program, uh, all the students, they, they do a postgraduate certificate in management. And then in the second quarter, they delve into their uh, specific major they chose from this list. After finishing three months of specialization, they go into the internship part. And this is where GCC um, comes into the, the, the course and they help us a lot with securing internships for, for students um, in their uh, specific major. So they gain a lot of uh, practical experience uh, in the major they chose during this uh, three months quarter. Once they finish nine months, students have the opportunity to land on a secured OPT. Uh, so we help them do an OPT in the US uh, for one extra year, where they gain more experience, where they delve more into the work market. And uh, this is where the whole combination comes into uh, rotation, where they gain um, the learning experience, postgraduate level transferable courses that they gain from the University of California, and then combine it with work experience. And a lot of these uh, OPTs are uh, actually paid. So that's all that also helps, um, you know, um, gaining more attention to this program from students from Europe, from India, from all over the world. Um, so this is great because students um, can receive postgraduate uh, degree, um, postgraduate certificate or diploma program from UCR. They gain one year of practical work experience they can join a network of students from all over the world. And, um, you know, they, they can gain, um, they can also get paid during that year of work experience. And then they have a diverse CV that they can use when, once they finish the program and go back to their home country. Uh, we also had, you know, a few number of students who, we're so lucky to get even uh, like H-1B visas during their OPT. Um, they worked with um, some uh, recruiters or companies in, in California, and they were so good that, you know, they were offered the opportunity to stay and, um, you know, um, just continue uh, their work with that um, local firm. So, this is the program in a nutshell, and I think um, it is really uh, important nowadays to diverse your CV. Uh, the practical experience is really important. Um, NMI uh, MS is on my uh, plan and on my map when I go next to India. So hopefully I will be visiting there soon. And um, that's it. I mean, thank you, Kate, for the opportunity and. I'll stay here for question and answer. That's great. Thank you so, so much. Um, and really glad. I, I think you've very well traveled. Nice that you've just been to India and back on East Coast time uh, with us. So thank you so, so much. Really appreciate it. Um, and we are going to stay in the US. Um, really glad to have our colleague Megan Amsia from InterExchange who's going to talk about a variety of things that are available through the J1 program. Um, and Megan, thank you for being here. I know it's early morning as well for you. So I'll hand things over to you to uh, share uh, your presentation. Thanks again. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, good morning, everyone. It's 7.30 for me. So um, morning, good evening, good afternoon um, for you, wherever you are. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, sort of the the variety of different uh, J1 exchange visitor opportunities that there are through the Department of State and also speak to the programs that InterExchange sponsors. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Well, it's not letting me share my screen, so that's lovely. Hold on a second. Sorry. I never really use Zoom, so I don't have no worries. I haven't allowed it on my computer yet. Oh, okay, good. Good, good. And I can also um, share from mine if you need me to as well. Um, I might need you to. Perfect. Okay.
Yeah, I'm going to just share it with you so that you can do that. For me. Sorry about that. No worries. We, we, we've added time for a tech interlude. So this is part of what that is as well, too. Not a problem. All right. I've just shared it with you. Perfect. Sorry about that. <laughs> While we wait uh, for that to, uh, uh, to uh, come up on Kate's screen, I just wanted to remind people of the Padlet. Um, I see there's quite a few of you interacting with that. But if you have any thoughts on, uh, on what has been posted, or you want to post your own thoughts, um, please go to the Padlet. Um, and uh, we should we had a QR code at the beginning. And also in the uh, comments uh, uh, chat function, uh, Kate has posted a link for that as well. So uh, please go over there. And uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts about it. Great. Uh, we are making one second here. And then Matt, if you wanted to um, reshare that link, uh, folks joined afterwards, that's also good. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, um, and Megan, I'm just gonna download this to my computer and it's going to be sure. a, uh, I'm going to, you, you get to do the um, uh, next slide, please, as okay. much as you need. So I'll, I'll be ready, ready to do that for you as well. Uh, um, may I also share something in the chat? I'm going to share the um, the fine programs okay. um, section of the um, Department of State um, exchanges page. So it's important um, if anyone's looking for to find the right program for them that you look that you specify whether you're looking for programs to come into the U.S. or to go out because there's two uh, separate platforms. Um, but when you go onto this page, you can select the the like where you are in your education you can select uh, which country you're from and then it will tell you exactly which programs you qualify for and which programs you would be able to to go on in the us so it's a really helpful page just to be able to navigate and see what opportunities are available to you um, in terms of um, programs that you can do and um, different kinds of visas that you can apply for um, but these these exchange programs are specifically for the j1 program and it can get a little bit um, confusing because there are, you know, 15 different types of J-1s. Um, so if someone says they're on a J-1 visa, um, you don't know exactly what they're doing unless they specify. Um, so you can so you can look at that link to uh, find the right opportunity for you. Cool. Excellent. And share screen now. Hold on one second. Here we go. Great. Perfect. See that okay? I can now, yes. Oh, excellent. Okay, so I realized I didn't really introduce myself. My name is Megan Ames. I'm the program manager for um, the career training program um, at InterExchange. Um, my background is in international education. I've uh, taught overseas, and then um, I did my master's degree in international education at Vanderbilt. And then I've worked on exchange programs, including the Fulbright program, Humphrey program, um, and now I work on the intern and trainee program. Um, I'm not seeing the slides yet. Oh, here we go. I'm saying loading to me. All right, let me just try. Let, yeah, I'm on, the, I'm on the slide that says who is inter-exchange and I'll get that up while if you want to. Okay, great. Um, so inter-exchange is um, a J-1, a designated J-1 visa sponsor that's designated by the U.S. Department of State. We're located in New York City and we represent more than 90 countries um, in our worldwide partner network. And we work directly with participants. So um, participants can apply directly through us to do their programs here in the US. So they don't need to go through a third party, um, but they can go through through a third party. And we do have partners that we work with um, to help you know, find good programs um, and opportunities for the students. Um, and you know, a lot of the partners that we work with are able to find um, really good internships that are really good fit with, for the students, um, but other students go directly through their universities. So it is a bit of a of um, a mix uh, between how students find their internships and training programs. But we have a number of different programs that we sponsor, not just the intern and trainee program that I work on. So one is the Au Pair USA program, which is um, to bring au pairs to the US um, to be with families here. I'll go through each of them in a little bit more detail. Um, the Camp USA is for the summer camp program in the US. 
uh, career training is both the intern and trainee program. Work travel is um, seasonal seasonal work here in the U.S. And then the working abroad and foundation programs are outgoing programs that we have as well. Uh, next slide, please. All right. <laughs> all right. So this is just uh, it sort of gives you a list of all the different types of J-1 visa categories. So you can see the variety that there is. So that's the link that I shared with everyone in the chat. But here you can see that there are really there's really a big <laughs> a big range. So you can uh, look at each of these within um, that website um, and see if that's the right um, the right category for you. Um, most university students will be eligible for the intern category um, or the trainee category right after they graduate. Um, the intern uh, category is for students that are current university students, and they would come to the U.S. to do an internship that is related to their degree. And the trainee program would be university students who have graduated and had at least one year of work experience. And then they would come and do a program that's related to the work experience that they have. Um, they can also come and do the trainee program if, even if they don't have a bachelor's degree, but if they have five years of related work experience. Um, and some of these other programs um, are more specialized and others are more broad. <laughs> um, so I'll go through each of them um, later on the presentation. So next slide, please. Um, so Career Training USA, that's my program. This is the program that covers both the intern and trainee categories. Um, and these participants come to the U.S. Um, to do to be placed in various businesses across the U.S. that can start at any time of year. So it doesn't need to be within the academic calendar, but it definitely does end up falling within the academic calendar because people are coming for a semester, um, over a break, or um, during the summer. Um, so they can come at any time of year to do internships here with U.S. employers. And it's really, all of the programs I'm talking about today are really beneficial to both the um, employer and to the participant. And that's the whole idea of these exchange programs. There's they're part of the Bridge USA program, which means that they're, you know, bridging the gap between the between different countries and giving people from other countries the opportunity to come to the US and giving people the US the opportunity to learn about people from those countries and their practices and their businesses um, and in their um, academic fields as well. So that's that's the idea behind all these programs. Um, and uh, so for the Career Training USA program, they really get a chance to be in U.S. businesses that are related to what they've been studying or the field that they've been working in and see the different ways that uh, what they know is done um, in a different context. Next slide, please. Um, so the Work and Travel USA program is for seasonal work assignments, and these students are placed um, all over the country. Um, they It doesn't necessarily have to be, I mean, it generally is not related to, to what they're studying or the work that they've done before, but it's really an opportunity for them to come and have a short-term program in the U.S. Um, and just learn about more about uh, the culture. So they'll be placed in um, a lot of sort of seasonal businesses. So maybe they'll be in um, a theme park. Uh, we we met up with a, I used to live in Thailand and we met up with uh, one of my husband's students who was in a theme park here um, in New York. And it was really exciting um, to see her in that context. And it wasn't related to what she was studying, but she just really wanted an opportunity to come to the US and um, get another perspective. So the work travel program is really great um, just to have a, you know, a short time here. And then afterwards, you have time to travel and uh, see more of the U.S. as well. Uh, next slide, please. The camp program. So uh, and, uh, the camps are really popular in the U.S. Um, it's really <laughs> a big part of U.S. culture to go to camp during the summer. And uh, summer camps uh, more and more have found that ha being able to bring uh, bring staff over from overseas to work at the camps during the summer adds the international perspective and gives the campers the opportunity to meet all of these counselors from all over the world as well. So the Camp USA program brings uh, people here for the summer to, to work at a summer camp. So it's, it's a little bit like the work travel program, but specifically at uh, summer camps. So it would be working with youth. Um, next slide. Uh, au pair USA. Um, so the au pairs come and they're placed in families in the U.S. and they can be here for up to two years um, and they provide uh, child care and take classes. Um, so this is another mm -hmm. opportunity that um, 
students can have often they do it after they've already graduated and they kind of um, want to go out in the world and have um, a different opportunity uh, if um, you know, something like the internship or trainee program, you can't work with um, children. Um, but if this is something that is interesting, you know, somebody who may want to be a teacher one day um, might be interested in the au pair program. Um, and this is also really attractive to U.S. families because they really like having, you know, someone in the household who is maybe speaking a different language um, and bringing a different perspective to their student. And then they end up having a child who speaks another language that they don't speak and <laughs> <laughs> they can tell secrets behind their backs. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's really fun. Um, actually, the way I found out about um, inter-exchange um, when I came back to the US from Thailand is I had a friend who had had an au pair um, from inter-exchange and it was a really, really a special experience for her. And she ended up having a, au pairs for about four years. And um, it's just really great. And her son really benefited from it. And she had a great relationship with the au pair. So um, this is another opportunity that uh, inter-exchange sponsors. Uh, next slide. So this is uh, just a clarification about the day one visa. So it is a temporary visa for these work and study based programs. Um, and it is required um, for someone who is doing an internship in the U.S. coming from an overseas context. So, um, you know, Omar was speaking about um, OPT, which is done after doing a program in the U.S., but the J visa is someone who would be doing their undergraduate degree overseas or master's degree overseas and then coming to the U.S. to do one, one of these programs. Um, so it wouldn't be something that would be done after doing an academic program in the U.S., um, it is not for ordinary um, employment purposes, um, and it's not a pathway to residency, citizenship, or other visas. So the idea is that someone would come over and do one of these programs, but then they would go back to their home country and share um, what they've what they've learned while they were here, um, and hopefully have um, you know a nice perspective of the U.S. when they return. So that's the spirit of the program, uh, rather than to have it as a pathway to residency. Next slide, please. Um, so what is a J-1 visa sponsor? Um, often, you know, we're asked, like, why, why do we need you involved um, to be able to do these types of programs? Um, so I'll speak to that um, on the next slide. Um, so the, or the sponsors are organizations that are designated by the Department of State to monitor and ensure that um, students and participants are eligible for these programs. And then we, once we've done uh, the application process with uh, the applicants, then we issue the documentation that is needed to get these types of visas. And then those participants bring them to the embassies overseas to come to the US. And then while they're here, we monitor them throughout the program, make sure that they're actually getting what they needed from the program. Um, and it's important that they understand that um, the sponsor is the sponsor and then the host is the host. And then we we work with both. We will both work with the participants and the sponsors to ensure that everything is going well. Uh, next slide. This is just kind of a you know, how, how, how it works. So you find the internship or you find um, the opportunity for work travel or whichever program you're doing, you apply for sponsorship, then you do the interview and um, uh, site visit with uh, your sponsor. And then after that, you would go to the embassy to do your interview and then travel. So that's how it plays out. Um, this is, you know, we've been talking about different kinds of opportunities this morning. Um, this is some of the reasons why people have set on our programs have said that they decide to come to the U.S. as opposed to another country. Um, you know, sometimes like the U.S. is a big country, so we're like, of course, we'll come here. But there, there's like a lot of competition out there, different uh, places people can go to get um, experience. So um, a lot of people say they want to come here to get um, you know, more intercultural communication skills by speaking English in uh, the place that they're doing their programs. Um, just being away from um, home, giving themselves some more independence and self-confidence, um, access to the industries that we have here. There are, you know, certain industries that the U.S. excels in. And uh, a lot of the workplaces um, do give this, the, uh, um, the participants the opportunity to be really involved in the process, especially smaller organizations. And then also just having exposure to new technology and new, new ways of doing things in the U.S. So this is what our students have said of why they come here. Um, this is just uh, explaining a little bit between intern and trainee um, that I talked about before. But that, that uh, link that I shared earlier today has a 
sort of big chart. It's a very detailed chart, but it's a big chart of all the programs. And it says like, what is, what it's for and what you have need to have in order to be eligible. Um, so you can take a look at that if you have, if you're not sure what you would be eligible for for. Um, and because each of them have very specific um, requirements. So essentially the intern is for when someone's in school, trainee is for when they've finished school and done uh, at least one year of experience. Um, yeah, it's, it's beneficial to everyone. That's the, that's the whole idea. It's supposed to be beneficial for those who are um, taking part in the program and also for um, the host employer. So, you know, whether it be a camp, whether it be a theme park, whether it be a family, whether it be a business, um, it's really beneficial to them to have um, interns, trainees, uh, participants from overseas coming to have these experiences and then the participants as well. So it's really, as I mentioned, just really supposed to be um, beneficial to both parties and, um, you know, help <laughs> with relations between our two countries. Uh, this is just our contact information. Uh, if you have any uh, interest in learning more or more about our programs, or if you just have uh, questions, that's all. <laughs> Thank you, Kate, for running the slides. <laughs> no worries. My pleasure. Glad that worked <laughs> well. Yes. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and captured some of that information, too. Really appreciate that as well. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Um, and I think next we are going to um, uh, head to a another part of the world. I don't know if I see our colleagues from Anglo here. Oh, yes, Leslie. Yeah. Hello. Hi, uh, Kate. Hi. Uh, sorry, I think uh, uh, Neha, our internship lead, should be joining. Hey, Neha. There yeah. she is. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much. We're going to hop, hop over the pond, actually, and head over to the UK. Even though, Leslie, I think you're based in Canada. You're one of our three Canadians on the call. Am I right? Uh, or no? no, I'm actually based in in the UK. Okay. Oh, perfect. Yeah, oh. Yes, uh, I'm from Canada, but wanting, based in the UK. <laughs> keep wanting to get connect you to Canada. Well, I'm going to hand things over to you and let you share opportunities or overview of Anglo. Thank you so, so much. Fine. Well, I'm going to have uh, Neha do the honors of the presentation, uh, but I just thought I would do a quick intro uh, that uh, I, I'm the uh, academic VP for uh, a long established uh, provider organization in the UK, uh, Anglo Educational Services, AS, uh, and uh, we've been assisting uh, US University Study Abroad programs, now better known as education programs, uh, for uh, internships, uh, mainly at the undergraduate level up to now, uh, have played a big part in uh, the development of our uh, academic and experiential learning services, uh, especially over the last 10 years. And uh, we work with uh, over 400 uh, students uh, in a given year, and that should grow as we return to in-person uh, education abroad, uh, especially to the UK. Uh, and more recently, we've been involved in uh, the so-called tier five, internships, which uh, uh, have grown out of what used to be known as the BUNAC blue card, giving uh, students from the United States uh, and elsewhere the opportunity of spending, say, anywhere from six weeks to six months in uh, an, an internship only program. Uh, ours are generally unpaid, but I'll leave Neha to speak more uh, specifically about that. Uh, but it is a case of where you do not need to be engaged in a study in an academic program, which applies to the other main visa for internships in the UK, known as student route or formerly tier four. This and the focus of our presentation here is about tier five internships, affording students who are on the cusp of graduating or maybe recent graduating, and it could be uh, 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 students who are from, uh, you know, all over the world. It, it's not confined to those who may be coming from the United States, but for non-UK nationals uh, to spend a period of time in a meaningful and well-defined, they have to be, uh, placement uh, that ideally will further uh, their career prospects or certainly will bolster uh, their uh, uh, program at the 
graduate and postgraduate level. Uh, and that's what we're seeing increasingly. Those who either have begun a master's program or about to do so. Uh, but without further ado, I'll pass the floor over to my colleague, uh, Neha, who is our uh, internship lead, our principal internship coordinator, and reports to our head of experiential learning, Beth Scoble. Uh, Neha, if you would do the honors, please. Yeah, thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Yeah, so um, as Leslie mentioned, we are um, Anglo and we are a study abroad provider um, in London with kind of nearly 50 years experience. As he mentioned, um, we kind of provide various services across the study abroad um, realm. So kind of internships for individual students or for university groups and um, kind of academic programs, educational tours, um, accommodation and things like that. But um, today we're here to kind of talk about our tier five program in London. So um, this is a program that runs throughout the year. So we have program dates in kind of spring, summer and fall. So the spring and fall programs tend to be semester long programs, uh, while, while the summer session can be um, kind of a little bit differently and a little bit more flexible. But within these three um, kind of cohorts, dates and timelines for internships are quite flexible. So um, that's kind of up to each you know, university group or each specific um, student when they kind of want to start and finish their internship and the length of time they want to do that for. Um, but in terms of the internship, it is a unpaid internship with a London based company. Um, obviously, Leslie mentioned the tier five visa. So this is the visa that allows um, students to take part in this internship and it allows them to intern for between 25 hours a week all the way up to kind of full time hours of 40 hours a week. Um, and that tends to be over Monday to Friday. And in terms of the length of time of the internship, um, this can be anywhere from kind of four weeks up to six months. So again, it's kind of up to each university group or up to each individual student. Um, so yeah, the program includes the internship, um, the visa, and then also housing in kind of central London. So zones um, one and two of, um, of London. And just to kind of go into detail on the internship more specifically, um, these are the kind of internship fields that we offer. So these are the broad areas, um, the kind of overview um, headings tend to be media, politics and law, um, business and economics, culture and arts, STEM, and then sciences and kind of social sciences and psychology. So in each of these areas, you can kind of see um, examples. Some of them are examples of types of companies that we work with within those areas, or some are examples of more kind of types of um, roles that students might undertake. So these do tend to be the fields that we offer internships in and that students tend to be interested in, but it's not kind of limited to this. So if there are areas outside of this um, that students are interested in, it's definitely not saying, you know, that won't be able to happen. Um, definitely kind of, you know, reach out and that can that can be discussed. This just tends to be um, the main overview of the areas that we um, that we do work in. And then just to give you kind of a bit more um, specifics, because I know that was quite a, an overview in terms of um, a list of the areas, specifically within um, different areas, we've got a few examples here. So um, an example of an English major, um, obviously, you know, you might think um, they were wanting to intern at a publishing house or um, a magazine or something like that. But actually, in this case, it was a travel media company um, kind of doing, you know, some print um, content, some online content. So it just kind of shows that even within the previous areas listed, it might not be the kind of first thing that comes to your mind. There are kind of more out of the box areas and specific interests that we can kind of um, cater to in terms of internships. Um, and then the second example here is a theatre major. So obviously, um, London has a very big theatre scene. We have the kind of um, West End and those kind of big theatres. And then we do have a lot of kind of small independent theatres um, dotted about London. So here we had a student placed with, with one of those doing a mixture of kind of uh, on the business side and marketing tasks um, and also kind of stage management and things like that. Um, and then the third example is a marketing major. So um, this tends to be a very popular area. And this specific student was interested in the um, uh, fashion industry, which, again, is quite a big um, industry in London. So they were kind of doing um, some creative marketing tasks for a company in, in that field. 
And then also just to mention um, internships post COVID. So we have kind of seen the internship market um, kind of change quite drastically. I would say the majority of companies and therefore the kind of majority of our internships um, now do tend to use a hybrid working model. So this will be where um, interns are kind of in the office or in an in-person um, kind of working situation part-time and then also remote working part-time. Obviously, this is completely dependent on um, the industry. So there are some specific industries, um, things like healthcare um, and education and things like that, where it obviously is going to be fully in-person. But we are just tending to find post COVID that apart from those kind of industries, um, the majority of industries and companies um, and internships do have a hybrid working model. So with our students coming over to London, they can kind of expect to be um, doing kind of a mixture of in office work um, and remote work. And this kind of ties in with the, the next bullet point here, the flexible schedules um, that kind of um, works when you're doing the hybrid working and working from home. But as I mentioned before, it still is. Monday to Friday um, working days for the internships. And then co-working spaces as well. We have seen an increase in this post COVID. So kind of co-working spaces or shared workspaces, a lot of companies are using these, um, especially the small to medium sized companies that we tend to work with. Um, so these tend to be kind of big buildings where there's um, multiple companies working from the same space. And we're actually finding that students are really enjoying this in terms of um, getting to meet and collaborate with um, different companies all kind of in one space and maybe even work from different locations in London kind of every week and see um, and explore different different parts of London in that way. So it is quite a, um, an added benefit to this kind of new way of working we tend to find. Perfect. And then I know I've kind of spoken about the internships um, specifically, but in terms of Anglo support and what we kind of provide through the programme, obviously BUNAC is the tier five visa sponsor that the visa application would be done through. But we do provide step by step UK visa guidance on this tier five visa. We have a dedicated member of staff as well um, who kind of helps with the visa applications. Um, we also provide all applicants with a student handbook. So this has various kind of tips and information on there. So things like how to format and write a CV for UK employers. As I know, CVs and resumes can be formatted quite differently in kind of different companies and different um, employment markets. We do kind of provide tips on that. Um, and mock interviews to prepare for potential host company interviews. Um, we also, as well as the student handbook, give out various other guides. So a pre-departure guide, which has more kind of housing information, aspects of living in London and working in London um, and different things like that that students might need um, prior to their departure to London. And then in all of our housing, we have 24 hour housing support. Um, we also provide an in-person arrival orientation when students arrive in London. So this will be at our offices and we will um, give various information on kind of internships, what you can expect, tips for kind of beginning your internship, um, and then also aspects of living in London, working in London, um, safety in London and things like that. And then we have a team of staff in our office in central London, um, kind of from 9am to 5.30pm every day. So we have kind of uh, members of the internship team, such as myself, also um, student services and student support members. Um, so someone is kind of there at all times. So we do have students popping in anytime, no kind of appointment necessary, just for kind of questions or issues or even just um, a chat and things like that. And then we do monitor the internships as they go on. So the main kind of point of this is a mid-semester site visit. So a member of the internships team would kind of um, attend the internship in person to speak to the student and speak to the supervisor um, and just have a discuss discussion to kind of assess the progress of the internship, make sure that all parties are happy and things like that. And then outside from the internship, we do um, have social events at Anglo. So like I mentioned, we have a variety of programmes, not just this tier five student um, programme. So we have um, the student route programme where there might be um, other university groups. So these, these social events are open to all of our students and all of our programmes. So it's kind of a great way to meet other students and kind of um, mingle and make friends in that way. Um, and then obviously being in London there are um, or being in the UK, there are um, a lot of other things that students want to do. So we do have an in-house travel department who can kind of assist with um, these kind of things. So weekend trips to different cities around the UK, um, theatre tickets, um, travel cards and different things like that. And then in terms of the benefits of um, undertaking an internship in the UK, obviously the main kind of 
um, benefit is that practical experience that students are gaining and kind of learning through in terms of their professional development and also having that international experience on their CV or resume, which hopefully obviously makes them um, stand out from the crowd and kind of leads to more employability. But we do tend to find um, feedback from previous students, a lot of the benefits aren't just limited to the internship and the placement itself, but kind of the experience of um, taking part in the programme and being in London as a whole. So um, obviously kind of skills of kind of being independent and developing confidence in kind of living in and exploring a new city, especially for those kind of longer term internships going up to that kind of six month mark. And then also just kind of living in London um, and, you know, it's a great city kind of culturally. There's so much to offer. So just kind of having that experience as well um, kind of goes hand in hand with that um, internship and kind of professional experience. But yeah, that's everything. Um, I've got the link to our website there. Um, there's more information on our kind of internship specifically, um, also on the tier five programme and kind of Anglo as a whole. And then um, our email address is there. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And um, I'm going to take us across the Atlantic again back to Canada uh, with our colleague Joe Baker. And I am going to give a brief introduction to Joe. I will uh, spoil things that I know we had a lot of interest in both the UK and Canada from from uh, registrants prior to the conference. So I feel like I'm in the middle of two very popular locations. Um, Joe, I'll just give a very brief introduction to you. Um, Joe Baker is a multi-passionate entrepreneur within Canada's tourism, hospitality, and education sectors, and a vocal advocate for an inclusive future-forward industry. He is CEO at Joe Baker & Co., a consultancy specializing in thought leadership, human capital, and operational excellence. He was previously Dean at Centennial College's School of Hospitality, Tourism, and Culinary Arts, where he led the most meaningful transformation in the school's over 50 year history. And I will add an ed editorial note that Matt Burns and I have both visited that campus and seen that firsthand. Um, Joe has added, had senior management roles at George Brown's College Center for Hospitality and Culinary Arts, including Director of Operations, Services and Partnerships. Before joining higher ed, he worked in hotels and managed restaurants. We'll save um, the education and associations and all the great things that Joe has done for later. And I'll just turn things over to you with thanks. Over to you, Joe. Thank you so much, Kate. Hope everybody's doing well this morning. I look forward to sharing uh, a lot about Canada's hospitality and tourism industry. For those interested uh, in coming to our country and for those interested in choosing a career path or at least the beginnings of your career path by uh, studies in hospitality and tourism, uh, I want to be able to give you a little bit of information in terms of the scope of our industry and the opportunities that are also here. But I think it's important to start with what tourism is all about. And tourism for me is emotional. Tourism is experiential. And tourism is the heartbeat of Canada. Now, before we get into the facts and figures, I wanted to show you a very quick video. I hope it's going to work. If not, I will share it in the chat. So sit back for two minutes and let's enjoy this.
that's the feel of our industry. Now let's get to some facts. How big is Canada's hospitality and tourism industry? We are a hundred billion dollars in annual revenue plus industry in Canada. That hundred billion dollars represents more than 5% of the entire Canadian economy. So hospitality and tourism is a force in this country. Now, of course, over the last few years, we've experienced some pretty significant challenges. All of us have global pandemic, travel restrictions. We weren't able to get out as much as we wanted to. We weren't able to welcome as many international guests, international visitors, or even international students. But in a healthy year, Canada's hospitality and tourism industry generates more than $100 billion. And we're working our way back. So that's projected income for this industry in 2022. Still takes time for the analysts to get through all the information to know where exactly we landed in 2022. How big is Canada's hospitality and tourism industry aiming to become? By 2030, Canada is aiming to generate $142 billion in annual income for the industry. So you can see there, we are on a very significant growth trajectory, which opens up a lot of opportunities for students, for future leaders, for future entrepreneurs. The Canadian hospitality and tourism industry is on an upward trajectory. But how big is Canada's hospitality and tourism workforce? You can't make all that happen without people. There are 2 million people working in Canada's hospitality and tourism industry. Now, 2 million people on a global scale may not seem significant, but it's very significant in this country. That represents one in 10 working people in Canada. One in 10 working people in Canada work in the hospitality and tourism industry. So this, if you were looking for where the opportunities are, these are all the different subsectors that fall under the hospitality and tourism industry umbrella. And these are people. These are the number of people working in each of the subsectors. Food and beverage, obviously, as you can see by the numbers there, is a very significant size. Recreation and entertainment is next. Transportation, accommodations, and travel services. So these are all career paths that fall under the umbrella of hospitality and tourism. Well, how many hospitality and tourism jobs in Canada are presently without workers? There are more than 150,000 jobs in this country, in the hospitality and tourism industry, that don't have workers. And why is that significant? That's significant because those all represent opportunities for people deciding to be in Canada and work in the hospitality and tourism industry. This is a very significant opportunity for people in terms of career growth. Now, you know how big the industry is trying to be. You know the size and the scope of the workforce in the present day industry. How big does Canada's hospitality and tourism workforce need to become to achieve that $142 billion in annual income? 2.5 million people by 2030. So you can do the math. There are 2 million people in this industry right now, more than 150,000 jobs without workers. And our goal is to have 2.5 million people in this industry by 2030. There are lots of opportunities in this industry right now and over the next several years. Just wanted to give you a high level summary of that. If you want to find me and reach out, connect, that's my email address, that's my name, that's my social media handle, that's also my website. We have lots of tools and resources available to you. Um, and as Kate mentioned, having worked both in the field as a professional and also in the education field, uh, there are lots of places that I can recommend should you decide that you want to pursue uh, joining us in Canada and uh, choosing to study and pursue a career in the hospitality and tourism industry. So thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. That was really nice. Kate, are you there? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, while we heard Joe speaking from Canada, I think now we're going to move towards um, 
Thailand, Bangkok, where Kala Anand, uh, she's currently there for a conference, but otherwise, of course, uh, Kala is from India, from Bangalore. Um, so Kala, I would like to just briefly introduce you. Kala Anand is the Vice President Global of Upgrad Connect, and she has been an absolutely great speaker yesterday. We had such great insights from her experiences speaking out on uh, internship, and today she's going to be touching up on Upgrad Connect, what it does globally. Over to you, Kala. Thank you so much, Naveen, and thanks for accommodating me. I'm between a lot of chaos here, so if you hear some background noise, do bear with me. Uh, we're kind of multi-conferencing, multitasking. Uh, it's lovely to be back. I didn't want to miss today, so I thought I should squeeze out to spend some time. Um, exciting to hear. I, I did log in to hear the last three speakers, and it's lovely to see the kind of partnerships you've got. Uh, we are fairly new in the space and Upgrad Connect comes with a, a very different attitude towards supporting international education journey of students. Now, Upgrad, uh, I, I guess about six years ago was an edtech startup, but today it is a unicorn in India. It, it is, um, you know, Asia's largest uh, edtech company with 5 million learners across the globe. Um, Upgrad Connect is a completely new approach uh, to the international education journey. Uh, at Upgrad Connect, we believe that study, career, and well-being is integral um, to every student's journey. So we help students with their um, study overseas, but also integrate that with career support as well as well-being support. It's not something we deliver ourselves, but it's something we would love to deliver with partners and we're partnering with many um, companies, including looking forward to working with GCC on that front. Um, so what is a practice? So as I said, uh, we work through the entire student journey, keeping uh, the three aspects in mind, but importantly, what we are looking at is the four A's of the journey. At, at the basis to any um, education journey for a student, we believe is a quality admissions uh, in, information and insights process, which is more around, you know, looking at um, what kind of information do our learners have about a destination? Uh, what are the kind of challenges they should see? What, what um, beyond just looking at admission requirements, what are your student rights? So we kind of lay a lot of emphasis on on everything that goes into developing uh, the admissions information and insights for a learner. And uh, I must clarify here that Upgrad Abroad doesn't directly work with students. We work with schools, uh, high schools and universities in India. So we help them help students. We don't direct, directly go ahead and um, you know, work with students. The first A, as I said, was admissions. The second A um, in the process is the application. Um, through a fantastic acquisition uh, that we made of a very global company um, based in Australia, um, Upgrad now has a very sophisticated uh, platform through which one can apply to 800 plus um, institutions around the globe uh, across destinations, US, UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, parts of Europe, Ireland, uh, which includes in Europe, um, and what, what the application process actually does is a fantastic high level vetting uh, where that's a single click opportunity and then goes on to also support the visa um, for the student, which is where it gets lodged across uh, multiple countries. That is the second bit, which is the application. The third part of the A uh, we focus is the aspiration. As I said, uh, it's not about just studies, but it's about how the study converts, how an education converts to careers. And in this uh, space, we work with um, career uh, support providers, internship providers, um, people who can provide as much support uh, to the student when they are on show uh, or even before they leave. Um, important among them is the business culture and communication, which is so different you know, for each country. Um, and hence we work with service providers. In the UK, for instance, we've just signed a huge partnership uh, with a company called Student Circus, um, who completely support students uh, with the uh, cultural training, the interview prep, um, searching for internship, the placements, as well as the post-study um, work rights uh, support. The final A in the whole process is assimilation. And this is really where the well-being comes in. It's important that students don't just look at 
um, universities, their rankings and where they stand, but importantly, how, uh, how does the destination fit? How does a, a particular institution fit with the nature of the student? And I think that's really happy student um, is a successful student is at the core of that belief that we look at what is the kind of um, uh, well-being support systems, what, what kind of opportunities is available for a student to culturally immerse themselves? Um, is a student prepared for a big city? Um, how do they cope with the loneliness of being um, an international student alone in a foreign country? These are some aspects we um, we help, uh, we take the help of professionals uh, to support with the students. So across the board, we, we believe that Upgrad Connect is a truly transformational service uh, which high school counselors uh, and international relations officers within um, universities in India will use. Uh, we have launched initially in India, uh, expanding more into South Asia of Nepal and Sri Lanka, and we will replicate this across multiple regions. Um, Upgrad Connect through its acquisition of uh, GSP in uh, uh, is now across uh, 23 destinations in the world, and uh, we'll take this far and wide. And we do look forward to working with um, partners we, we have seen on this platform today um, who will support the student journey before, um, before they leave, as well as when they are on show. So I will stop there and happy to um, answer any questions later. I'm sorry, I might have to rush back in into the conference. Thank you, Kala. That was wonderful to hear from you what Upgrad Connect does. And of course, we will take questions. I know you're heading off to a conference. We will take questions and maybe we'll post it out there for you to respond and we will take back to the audience again. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, so yeah. Thank you Kate and, um, and Mr. McKenzie. Lovely to uh, be back and connect. And thank you, Naveen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, now, I think so. We, we will transfer again or travel back to Central America, Peru. And we have a wonderful speaker again talking about an organization which is headed out in Peru, uh, a good friend of mine, James Saraya. But right now I know he is in uh, Colombia. So James, over to you. And before I uh, kind of introduce our thing, I just want to talk about James a little bit, uh, just a brief introduction on James. Uh, is James is the founder of Instituto Perucano. Since 1996, James is working and designing educational projects in urban agriculture focused on food sovereignty, addressing social injustices, and developing micro enterprises in Latin America, East Africa, and Southeast Asia. James is a scholar of the Minority Health International Research Training Program, funded by the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, a fellow at UNSchool of Disruptive Design, an alumni of Mesa's Bay Area Farmer Training Program, a board member of Chicano Latino Alumni Association of University of California, Berkeley. He was the director of programs and partnership at Smash Academy for eight years, a science, technology, engineering, and math US-based organization for socially disadvantaged students at the Kapoor Center for Social Impact. He called a smash, he scaled a smash model at the Kapoor Center, which focused on strategic alliances with university partnerships, notably at the University of California, Berkeley and Stanford University. Over to you, James. Wow, well, muchas gracias, buenos días. Good morning, everybody. And thank you very much, Naveen. And also thank you very much, Kate, for the invitation. Uh, I'm actually, uh, because Naveen is my friend, I'm going to uh, just uh, provide a little geographical reference. Um, and we're actually in South America. Central America is the, the region, um, you know, in between North and, and South. And I think that's something that's very common. Um, a lot of times we've forgotten about here in South America. Um, I'm a um, US citizen, but also a Peruvian citizen. Um, and I think it's important uh, to uh, represent geographically. The world is, is uh, large. And if I was actually called out to uh, identify regions uh, geographically in Asia, I would probably be <laughs> Um, at a disadvantage, um, but I really appreciate the invitation today, and I just want to recognize all the, the speakers. It's really amazing to be a part of a group that's um, uh, trying to support young young uh, professionals, and I um, look at young professionals like anywhere from 15 to 35 years old, um, and I am very deeply connected to uh, working with young people and supporting, mentoring, and advising um, you know, as, as you're, you're moving through your careers and your trajectory. Uh, we're in a global space um, that's completely transformed once again uh, because of the global pandemic. And it's important to, um, you know, look at the challenges, but look at the opportunities. Here we are um, from around the world coming together. Um, and it's, it's amazing to be able to connect with everybody. 
Um, I, as uh, Naveen mentioned, I founded Instituto Perucano, it's an, an association. Um, part of our global um, education and competencies understand that um, and we're not all the same, you know, in the United States, for example, we have nonprofits and in Peru, we don't have nonprofits. Um, we have associations that represent uh, the equivalent of what a nonprofit is internationally. Um, so I set up an association in Iquitos, Peru, it's in the Peruvian Amazon um, uh, to support young people as they're expanding their experiences in, in professional spaces. Um, in Peru, we, we don't have a lot of access to traveling and um, you know, uh, inter international exchanges like a lot of the places in the global north um, have, especially in the United States and Europe. And it's important to recognize the, the uh, vast uh, resources that have been shared today. I just want to specifically call out, you know, I, I was going to go into one of our partners in the United States that um, supports the J1 program, um, but I'll just, you know, redirect, you know, the conversation from Megan's presentation, um, an inter-exchange that covered the topic of J1 programs. Uh, part of our work internationally is to support um, people coming to Peru from the, the world and then people from Peru going, um, you know, to explore the world and ideally coming back. Um, there's such a need for a focus on conservation, preservation, and especially in areas that I work in, in agriculture and sustainable development, uh, sustainable agriculture and, and food sovereignty. Um, it, it, you, everybody probably has experiences from the global pandemic about access to food. Um, I remember during the, the pandemic in Peru, um, they allowed one person from a household to leave the house and then to, uh, to walk um, to the local store and wait hours in order to receive food and then come back home and, and carry it back to your house um, as opposed to using transportation. Uh, so I think that that in itself provided a lot of Peruvians uh, could speak in that context about understanding how fragile our global uh, food systems are and how dependent we are on import and, and exports. Luckily in Peru, uh, we actually have, um, you know, we grow a lot of our food and, and instead of exporting, uh, we we're able to actually uh, take advantage of, of resources that we would normally send to the global community and uh, support our own food sovereignty. Difference between food security is just the access of food, but actually culturally relevant food is in a context of food security. Um, it's really important, I think, to, to uh, understand that, that the world is changing vastly. And, and as a young person, um, you, know, you are arguably more, more at a place to pivot and change than sometimes um, established organizations and individuals that have been in places for many years and decades. Their experience is, is uh, unmatched. Um, but your your experience as a young professional is also unmatched. They don't have that. And I, I think some of my best mentors that I have uh, are young people. Um, I always have a, my students that I work with in um, our programs and, and fellowships and agroecology is my students to keep me connected to what's happening um, around the world and also relevant technology. You know, a lot of us weren't necessarily born in uh, a digital world. And if you're arguably under the age of 30, um, even arguably under the age of 40, then you are wildly connected to technology in a way that, you know, older generations um, struggle to keep up with. Um, so I, I guess part of my, my presentation today is just advocacy to understand your worth, understand, you know, your perspective, and also understand where the opportunities are, what you want to engage with and what you want to learn. Uh, so I invite you to kind of learn more about um, other places in the world. Yes, the United States is an amazing place, um, and we support actually a J1 training program in sustainable agriculture. Uh, we have partners in in Sri Lanka and as well, as well as in Kenya that we do exchanges with to Peru and also sending students to those countries and those regions in the world. And so if you're interested in kind of looking for a cross-cultural experience that really um, exemplifies kind of like going back to the roots, if you will, um, I, I encourage you to look at, um, you know, where do you want, what do you want to learn and where is that, you know, where's the opportunity going to uh, support your work? If, for example, we speak in, in, in um, in Peru, uh, uh, Quechua and Spanish is the, the national languages, um, and English is kind of the educational access to the university. So if you're interested in learning about other cultures and, you know, not just expanding on um, your knowledge by the languages, I think that's what the international community that isn't necessarily in English centric um, to uh, expand your, your perspective through that cultural lens. Um, I think I, I just want to uh, go into one specific example of, of how the world is changing. And I think a lot of times when we talk about agriculture, especially in the context of the United States, if we talk about farmers, uh, a farmer is one person. And a lot of times in Latin America, and especially in Peru, a farmer is not one person, it's a family. Um, and I think when people ask me what I do, I, my background is in sustainable agriculture, agroecology, which is the, looking at the ecology of agricultural system to make decisions and implement um, uh, uh, roles. 
Um, but I think it's really important to understand your role as a professional, a young person. You know, if you studied, for example, like agriculture or if you studied, um, you know, marketing, to me, those are one and the same because you need marketing for agriculture. Um, families in Latin America are not necessarily going to school uh, that uh, live in farms and are part of the farming community. Like they're actually going to school for more technical areas like finance, uh, marketing, communications and legal areas so that they can represent their family farm um, away from this idea of a farmer, one person uh, to a community. And I think um, the, the little I know about India and other parts of Asia, there's still a lot of farming communities. And I'm not sure the, the cultural context of, of how people value agriculture um, or people that produce food, um, but it's something that we're trying to pivot on and, and actually expand uh, so people have a better appreciation for people that work in, in food systems, not just the selling of the food or producing it in restaurants in that industry, but the people that produce the food. Because without production, you can't have the other parts of the, of the, the industry to support. Um, so I just wanted to share that, offer that, that perspective up about disrupting this idea of what is a farmer and this kind of community that actually is really what supports um, food systems. Um, and invite um, you, if you're interested, to learn about um, ways to engage in, in sustainable food systems, entrepreneurship, and education. Uh, to engage in, in, in um, organizations around the world. And the last thing I'll just mention is that this idea of, you know, uh, I think it's it's really, I think a lot of times I find students are really humbled and I really wanted to encourage you to uh, take advantage of your offered an opportunity to connect directly on the president of Instituto Perucano and the founder, you know, and I'll share my information in the chat, but if, if the invitation is genuine, like the rest of the presenters today speaking uh, from their heart and from their experience about where they want to share and support, you know, we, we don't do this uh, for any, I, I woke up at 5 a.m. this morning uh, here and it's, I think it's uh, 7, it just turned 7.30 uh, here in Colombia. And it's important to understand that we don't do this because we, you know, have necessarily an economic or uh, other gains. It's really for the support of our global community, global education and this intrinsic value that we want to support um, young people and youth and, and young professionals um, achieve their goals. So thank you very much. I look forward to any questions and opportunities to engage. And I really appreciate this opportunity to connect with everybody and really uh, provide a different perspective um, representing um, uh, South America. Thank you so much. That's great, James, that was lovely. Thank you so much. What a beautiful way to end our trip around the world. So thank you all so much. Uh, we do have time for just a few questions if anybody wants to put those in the chat. Um, I have been looking over at the Padlet and we'll let you know that um, uh, James actually uh, hit a few of the questions that were over there on the Padlet. So your timing was perfect, um, including opportunities for agriculture students. And in addition to that, sort of looking at community and networks and um, thinking about sustainability and entrepreneurship. I know those were themes and particularly that multidisciplinary theme has been the case um, throughout um, the, the, the presentations today. But um, again, what an exciting and energizing uh, tour of the world and introduction to a range of different services and programs as well. Just take a few minutes if there's anything speakers want to add or any questions. Otherwise, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll move forward, but I'll pause briefly there. All right, quiet time on Zoom. That was hard for me to do, to count to 10. <laughs> Great, um, so Matt um, and Naveen, over to you. We're going to shift into, we've, we've heard a lot of uh, practical examples of programs and services and expertise. We're going to shift to actually hearing from some students who've completed programs. And I believe we'll be starting with our freshest alumni. We'll be hearing from some alumni soon. Um, and Naveen, I'll let you set up this video uh, uh, as well, but I'm looking forward to hearing the voices of some students, both a few recorded and a few in person, um, again, to take that shift from how the world is changing, what employers are looking for, how students are preparing yesterday, to a tour around the world, lots of different programs and services and, and expertise uh, throughout these uh, past hour and 90 minutes, um, and then shifting into the outcomes, hearing from some of the alumni of past programs as well. Um, so Naveen, if anything to set up for this video, I'll let you do so. Sure, thank you, Kate. Uh, I think uh, just to bring into perspective, I think it's just kind of trailing into the perspective of what alumni are thinking about 
education and employability, you know, how connect, we are connecting them together. And today we have at least about four of them. And out of those four, two are recorded versions of our students back from University of Auckland, New Zealand, who have shared their videos about their experiences. So over to you, Matt, for the video. Thank you. And all the way from Mumbai, India. I am Namaste, Merinam Tabby here. Hello, everyone. My name is Tabby, um, and I have just returned to New Zealand all the way from Mumbai, India. I am so lucky to have spent six weeks in Mumbai interning at the New Zealand Consulate and Urja Trust in Dada. Um, I'm honestly so blessed to have spent six weeks in India. If I had a chance, I would spend six weeks more. It was an amazing experience and it's genuinely life changing. So if you ever have a chance to study abroad or work abroad, please take that chance because it makes you realize a lot of different things about yourself, but also the wider world. Um, and it's a great way to learn. I think travel is the best teacher. So please take that chance. Um, GCC were fantastic in helping navigate my internships. Before I left, I uh, had an amazing call with Naveen from GCC, who actually helped me realize what I wanted to work with or intern with, what I wanted to intern with. Um, I'm a law and global studies student, so I'm quite passionate about human rights and global politics. And I didn't know what I wanted to intern with or who. And Naveen sat me down over the call and she listed a range of options. She's like, do you want to study or work in law or do you want to work in policy or do you want to do research about women's rights or do you want to do this? So don't feel too scared if you're quite unsure about what you want to do yet. Um, GCC are fantastic in helping you build those blocks and make those decisions. And so I ended up wanting to work in a lot of law and policy work in general and working at the New Zealand Consulate was fantastic. Once you get your internship, you do have an interview with your new employer. And I was quite scared at first, but the system and the process is really smooth. And you realize that as much as it is for them to get to know you, it's for you to get to know them too. You're going to be spending all this time with these people. You want to learn the ins and outs of the company and what you could bring to the company because you have to be a right fit. And so I asked a lot of questions. Um, I was curious about what kind of work I'd be doing, what the challenges they face normally are. But they also asked me what I was passionate about and what work I wanted to end up doing. And so it's really cool that GCC makes sure that you feel very comfortable before you even arrive in the country and that you're comfortable about the work that you want to do and that it aligns with something that you're passionate about. Um, I also worked at Ojo Trust, an organization that helps women who are homeless, um, young women, and kind of navigates a new life for them as well. So I was doing policy research and understanding how Ojo navigates and how maybe there were new ways to introduce things to their policies and make it easier for the women there. But also I got to go um, on site and visit the crisis and development shelters. And the women there are amazing. And I learned a lot from them as well as the organization as a whole. But I think you just come to realize that you figure out what you like and what you want to do for, for your real life. And that's amazing. I mean, a few of us worked in the slum areas, you know, they were working as uh, like helpers for the doctors there or even doing medical research. Um, one of my friends was working in a finance, microfinance specialization at a major um, corporate firm in Novi Mumbai. So there are no limits to what you can ask for. Um, GCC do their best to cater to you. So aim for the stars. I mean, I never thought I would be working at the New Zealand Consulate in Mumbai. But if you don't ask, you don't get. So be ambitious and put your all into it. GCC are really amazing in helping you with that decision process and finding what fits for you. Um, also, the cultural aspect of it is amazing. I never thought I would fall so in love with a country before I'd even, you know, spent even a full two months there. But the next chance I get to India, I'm hopping on that flight and coming right back. So the impact and the friendships and the connections you make are lifelong. Um, really, GCC help you with that. So don't feel frightened. I also think being a bit nervous or a bit excited is a good thing. That's how you um, build that excitement for the internship. 
and you just have to put your heart and soul into it. Make sure that everything you put in is what you're going to get. If you don't put in all that effort and all that excitement and all that energy into the work, it won't be as fulfilling. So make sure you go in there with an open mind and that's how much you will get out of it. Good luck. Um, I'm a message away. And yeah, thank you to DCC for your help. Thank you, Naveen and Muller. It's been fantastic. Good luck. I'll read that. No. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt, for playing that video. Uh, I would like to call uh, our next alumni, our older one, of course, the Carl Alder, who's currently, I think he works in Paris, but now he's back in Mumbai. So it's great to see you, Carl, back in Mumbai. Uh, over to you, Carl. Uh, I don't think I'm able to put my video on. Um, it says it's been disactivated, deactivated. Um, Oh, okay. There we go. Oh, there you go. Hi. Hi, Naveen. Hello. Hi. Hey, good. It's great to be here. I am indeed in Mumbai right now. Um, so I participated in an exchange through the University of California, um, uh, over the course of which I conducted an internship um, at Herbs Mumbai, which is a research collective and kind of um, urban design firm based in Haravi. And so they work with um, local contractors and builders to realize um, mostly how construction of mostly housing projects um, in informal settlements across the city. And they have offices, um, other offices kind of all over the world and, and a wonderful network. Um, so I think my experiences over the course of the internship and, and my time in Mumbai were um, more, more impactful than, than any other kind of period in my life. Um, I had been to India before. Um, I wanted to participate in some sort of, um, research project or hands-on activity, um, that, uh, that would give me more depth to my experience, um, in India, um, and my relationship with it. So, um, that that definitely happened over the course of my time here. In 2018, I conducted a research project on uh, uh, Mumbai's metro system over during which I interviewed residents of you know various informal settlements across the city um, in places where the metro had already come up and in places where um, it still hasn't, but it will soon um, to sort of determine how, this new system will affect those those people. Um, and uh, with herbs, I had access to translators and just uh, a wealth of information and knowledge that I wouldn't have been able to access otherwise. Um, so I developed the um, those interviews um, and my experiences here. Um, into a thesis during my bachelor's, at the end of my bachelor's degree at UC Berkeley. Um, and after that, I, I did a master's degree at Sciences Po in Paris in urban governance. <laughs> and uh, since I finished that at the end of June of last year, I've been working in transportation research um, at an international organization based in Paris. So I think that what I do now is um yeah i mean it's it's not the grassroots sort of stuff that i was doing at herbs and it's not really what um what they tend to focus on but that the experiences i had here have really taught me the importance of um of of knowing and and considering um how projects will affect um all people in a space um, so yeah, I've, I've been able to come back to India many, many times since, uh, since my internship, I have still have very, very close connections with herbs. Um, I'm going back to their office tomorrow to help with a workshop that they're putting on for students from, uh, the UAE. And, um, it's, it's amazing. I, I think that, um, my life today wouldn't wouldn't be what it is without 
having had participated in um, in the program I did, and I'm I'm just just so grateful for it. Um, after I did the program, I was inspired to start learning Hindi. Um, so I I got a scholarship from the U.S. State Department to um, participate in a Hindi immersion program, um, and yeah, it's 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 been an amazing journey and just so personally and professionally helpful to me um so that's that's pretty much what, what what i have to say and um thank you naveen for asking me to be here it's it's really a great honor thanks carl uh, actually it's it's our honor that you're really talking about uh, the kind of work you've been doing uh, so next our next uh, student or alumni is going to be again from university of auckland uh, and he again there's a video going to be played matt yes thank you very much for that Jota, hello my name is josh it's a pleasure to meet you all here this evening for this panel and to hopefully add some uh, insightful contributions uh, to the topic of connecting employability and higher education. Uh, so as I said, my name is Josh. I'm from New Zealand, uh, li lived in Auckland my whole life. Uh, I studied at the University of Auckland, studying a conjoint degree uh, with law honours and a Bachelor of Commerce, majoring in information systems and marketing. I also do a bit of part-time study in the Master of Laws program. Um, Nowadays, uh, since graduating, I've uh, been commencing work as a full-time lecturer at the University of Auckland. Uh, so I'm split my, I've split my time 50-50 between the Department of Commercial Law and the Department of Information Systems and Operations Management. Um, so I suppose I'm a good person to be speaking on this topic of education and employability. Uh, before this, uh, I worked in various law firms, uh, working, uh, of course, doing some legal research in Mumbai, India, under the internship program, kindly run by Naveen. Uh, and I also did some work in some commercial law firms uh, here in Auckland, and then both overseas in Sydney in a major global international firm, uh, and then also working in a boutique law firm. Uh, and an, an experience that really resonated with me was uh, my, my January 2019, uh, where I had the opportunity to work in Mumbai, India, uh, under the guidance of Naveen. Uh, she connected me with uh, partners working in Dharavi, Herbs, Mumbai, uh, where I was able to conduct some legal research and become fully immersed into the environment there. Uh, these, these experiences really shaped uh, who I am today, I believe. Uh, and I continued my work along these lines, um, as I say, from doing various jobs, working in education, and also trying to connect uh, the topics that I wanted to choose to study in my law degree as well. Speaking specifically to the topic for today, connecting employability and education. Uh, for me in my job now, it's quite a unique situation, given I actually work at the University of Auckland. Uh, but I believe my education has really enabled me to be in a position to now help students through their own education and journey. Uh, and similarly, I think a key part of this is uh, focusing also on their employability. Uh, so I've got three key points that I'd just like to cover today, um, which hopefully speak to that point. So uh, the first point is that education is really necessary for your employability. Uh, especially with particular jobs, um, mine, for example, uh, working in the law firms, uh, you have to have certain qualifications and accreditations to be able to work in certain industries. So, of course, getting your foot in the door uh, is going to require some of um, some experience in high education. Uh, now, the second point that I have is that education teaches you really good skills. It's not just the knowledge that you get from university about certain subjects that matters too much. It's more so the skills that you get. Uh, and that's why we're focusing on at the University of Auckland uh, graduate capabilities for what we must ensure all of our graduates have by the time they leave university. So some of those key skills that I think uh, you can get from a high education degree include the likes of your presentation skills. Um, having to work through assessments, work in group settings and pre present to various audiences, whether it's by yourself, whether it's in a group, whether it's on a research topic, whether it's on a more business focused presentation or something more scientific even. 
Um, the second skill is organisational skills. You have to learn to carefully and meticulously plan your diary around all the deadlines that you've got coming on uh, and also to work out your study schedules and whatnot. I think this also goes quite hand in hand with your soft skills, learning to communicate and network with professional employers uh, looking to bring people into their companies, alongside lecturers and, and alongside your peers as well, uh, and understanding how you can all add value to, to each other's lives. I think perhaps one of the most important skills you get from a higher education degree is the ability to critically analyze your concepts. Um, so the focus is now shifting much, much more towards actually analyzing uh, certain, certain parts of a, of a subject area, instead of just being able to regurgitate content directly from a textbook, being able to think critically for yourself, see how you can add certain uh, perspectives on, uh, on existing scholarship as well. Now, the third thing I'd like to talk about is uh, the value of your network that you can gain from higher education. Uh, the people I went to India with uh, on that internship are still my good friends and we see each other very often. Uh, the people I went to university with are now my best friends and uh, we do most of our things all together. We do life together. You really do have a sense of community in high education settings. We share these similar interests as you're all wanting to push yourselves and mutually grow together um, and, and find the right career for you. These important connections have seriously found me in places, roles, and times that I could never imagine. Uh, working in India uh, and Dharavi being one of them. The experiences I had with the education really allowed me to also gain a, a, gain a much more global perspective, especially from the internship in India. Uh, in turn, this connected me directly uh, with my employability both here in New Zealand and overseas. Uh, the law firm that I worked over in Sydney was really impressed with my experiences over in India. Um, and I, I believe that this really contributes towards creating people with a better global perspective and a better understanding of the value they can actually add to your organisations. Um, that's really all I wanted to cover today. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. I hope you enjoy the rest of the panel and um, I'm happy to take any questions, uh, should there be any. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for playing that video. Uh, our next student uh, alumni uh, is Jacqueline Matos. Uh, over to you, Jacqueline. Um, you disabled my uh, camera as well. It says I can't share my um, camera. I think it was turned off. Matt. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Jacqueline Matos. I am 25. I am someone that travels a lot in terms of moving around from place to place. Um, so I'm originally from Florida and New York City but I currently am, am living in Boston, Massachusetts um, for teaching. I'm an art teacher. I teach at a public charter school. And when I went abroad for India, I was, a, I think, a sophomore or junior in college. Um, so, you know, still young, still figuring out what things I am interested in, thinking about what job careers I want to do, trying to figure out how to incorporate my degree in anthropology with education and things like that. And I think Naveen did a great job of putting me at an NGO in a school that was focused on the curriculum and education, but I was also able to apply a lot of the anthropological skills that I learned in my classes to better understand the culture, understand the people, and how to, you know, share information with each other. Um, not only was I able to work at the school, but I was also able to um, do things that were fun in the school as well. So not only being the teacher or a co-teacher, but I was also a dance teacher as well. So we did a little dance performance where the students were bringing awareness for uh, pollution during that time of monsoon. Um, and I think this program I talk about is still to this day. Um, the program really helped me open my eyes to opportunities that I didn't think I could have as someone that's doing anthropology in the educational field. Um, I thought you had to, you know, have your master's in education and only, you know, go that route in college. But I realized with my degree in anthropology and now having a master's or getting a master's in education, I'm seeing how I can make that 
job that I did with the school in Calaba, Mumbai, something that I can do long term, and which is something that I was actually bringing up to Naveen, like, hey, I wanted to reach back out with you to the school, seeing how I can reconnect with them and um, bring other things and knowledge that I've learned from my master's degree back to them in case they have any questions or, you know, how we do things in America. Because I know when I was working at the school, a lot of the teachers were asking for my input, like, how are you teaching English to students? How is that with um, certain ages? How is the curriculum different? How are you guys more hands-on? Um, and I was also able to get their perspective as well of how the curriculum is very different in India, but there's also this culture that is in India and in the schools um, in terms of how students are with their teachers. And even though I was not uh, you know, a native to you know, India or to Kaloba, Mumbai, the students accepted me because of my role as a teacher. Um, and I think that's very different than people in America. Like if there's someone from abroad coming to teach, they're not really accepted as easily as you know I was accepted by those students. And I was also able to, um, um, my cohort, we're very close still. I still speak to um, at least six of them from um, UC Berkeley. Um, and they, something that I was able to gain from that is connections because a lot of them work in totally different fields than I. One of them was working with sex, uh, sex workers. The other was working with um, students or, or kids who had AIDS. Another one was working with health consultants. So I was able to gain a cohort of individuals that have certain skills and um, opportunities that I may have never known about, but we all were able to come together because of our interest in India and understanding other cultures and understanding other people. Um, and so one big thing that I gained from this is being open-minded, um, kind of like what the first presenter said, don't sell yourself short because I was very intimidated. Like, I don't have the, you know, the requirements for this. I'm not even a, you know, I don't have a degree in education. How can I do this? Um, but they were very uh, willing to help me and guide me through the process. And so it wasn't as scary as I was going through it than I thought before. Um, so I'm really grateful for this opportunity and I'm looking forward to reconnect. I, I am thinking of coming back in June. So hopefully I get to see you Naveen in June. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. That was amazing to bring back all those old memories. Thank you so much for that. Over to you, Kate. Kate, we are not able to hear you. Hey, Kate, unfortunately, um, it doesn't sound like your microphone is working. Um, <laughs> So it's uh, it's we're still working at the joys of uh, the Zoom age and uh, and whatever the case may be. Um, I just wanted to step in and thank the students. I I'm always amazed by my by my colleagues and the passion uh, of the work that they do, but even more so to the students who I think are incredibly courageous. Um, and uh, a few of the students talked about this who open up themselves to new experiences and um, and get out of their comfort zone and it's where they it's where they grow the most so um, um, I um, before I, I I think you can see my screen right now um, these are um, some some uh, some ideas of uh, where you can where you can go to find out more information about the Global Career Center <clears throat> and to send them an email if you want to find out more about their programs. And um, I'm going to pass it over to Naveen, maybe to wrap up. I, I'm not sure if Kate's microphone is just not working. The gremlins in, in uh, Boston seem to have taken over um, um, Kate's uh, uh, laptop. But uh, maybe I'll throw it over to you, Naveen. Oh, actually, before I, before I leave, uh, we have recorded today's session, and we are continuing to record it, and it will be uploaded to YouTube and passed along to absolutely everyone who registered um, for this conference, whether it was online or whether they were online or not. And <clears throat> and I think it's uh, it's been a really action-packed uh, two hours full of great information from literally around the world. So really impressed by uh, the job that Naveen Kate 
and their colleague Kat have done, and as well uh, Chris McKenzie with GCC, um, have done putting these uh, these presentations together. But so I'm going to throw it over to Naveen to have the last word, and uh, and then we'll convene the session. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Kate, I think I'm sure you're able to speak now if you unmute yourself. No? You should unmute. Go ahead, Naveen. You can have the last word. No, I think you should do the annual convening. You should do it, and then I'll take it over. <laughs> please, please. No worries. I Nothing to add to what Matt said, just to thank you to speakers, our students, and all of those in attendance. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. Um, <clears throat> that my, uh, my speaker issue is because my... Uh, my AirPods ran out of power because there was so much great information going through them. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all of that. Um, and Naveen, a huge thanks to you and to Kat for all of your work putting this together, as well as again, a thank you to our convening partner, NMIMS, and to our technical partner, International Internship Network. Naveen, last word is yours. Thank you. I think uh, it was absolutely a great launch pad. Uh, I think I never even thought that it's going to be such a successful event. Thank you so much, speakers, conveners. Uh, yes, definitely Mina Saxena from NMIMS to take it up and support us in this thought. Uh, when we were kind of just discussing about it and we said, hey, why don't we do this and see how that goes? You know, thank you for that. And Matt, you have been amazing. I mean, come on, without the technical things, we wouldn't have been able to do this. So you have been a rock star. Thank you so much for that. And Chris, it's so amazing to see you back here as a DCC team. We are so proud to show off ourselves about what we do. Um, you know, yesterday somebody was telling me, they called me and they said, you know what, you guys are doing such amazing job. Why aren't you kind of marketing yourselves and just there in the global space? I'm like, yes, we are, but we don't want to put our badges and walk around. And, but I think so we are proud to say that we're doing an absolutely great job. And with all our partners around the world, what else can we ask for? You know, it's been a great, great collaboration, uh, all the speakers over here. And we are looking forward to many more associations and many more linkages over here and great going. And I think we were gonna have this as an annual event, more so not as an online, we likely should have an offline one soon sometime next year, maybe. Yeah, till then, kudos, thank you, bye-bye.